This Future Construct podcast episode is supported by Applied Software. Applied Software is on a mission to transform industry by empowering their clients and championing innovation with real world expert consultants. So visit asti.com, it's A-S-T-I.com, and please let them know that we here at Future Construct and BIM Designs sent you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Future Construct podcast. I am your host, Amy Peck. Today, we have the founder of VIM, Sanjay Mystery. Welcome, Sanjay. Hi, Amy. Uh, thank you for having us um, here uh, on this podcast. It's a pleasure being here. Yeah, so, you know, I'd love to hear, I want to hear about the, the company, but I'd love to hear about your journey into this industry. So, uh, we have to dial that back a bit, because obviously I'm quite old in this world. Um, <laughs> So, you know, uh, no, so, yeah, no, my journey, um, I suppose it began a, a, a long time ago, actually, because I was one of those fortunate little children who knew what they wanted to do when they were about seven, eight years old, having watched a program about computer graphics. And I followed that ever since. And so um, through secondary school in the UK and, uh, and then into college and, and university, oh. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, you know, I, I kind of had a, a name and a focus in mind, and that was computer graphics at the time. It was in its infancy, obviously, back in the 80s. And so, um, you know, getting into the industry was hard, but I had some really good teachers along the way. And, so, and then, you know, through that journey, was it sort of a natural progression into the world of AEC? Uh, or did you start off on more kind of a creative bent? I mean, I would say they're, I would argue they're all creative, but, you know, yeah. more in the creative industry and then kind of shifted into AEC. When, when was that, that aha moment for you? That's a, yeah. So I actually was an animator. So I actually did feature film animation. I did visual effects. I was a CG supervisor for uh, many of the production companies in London and uh, had, having worked in, in both feature film animation and feature film visual effects um, had taken me around, uh, you know, from that side. But from my college days, my university degree initially was a architectural degree. It started off as an architectural degree, but I soon found that it wasn't really my, um, my calling. And there was a animation course that I really wanted to do. So I actually, tr I actually studied traditional animation cell animation uh, back in um, at Bournemouth Art College uh, in the UK. And that was really funny because, um, you know, you learn so much through the notion of drawing. And, and then we took on the whole computer graphics piece um, as we took on the, uh, the elements of traditional animation into next generation character animation, visual effects, and now, you know, every, you know, every probably cartoon animation in the, you know, on TV is probably some form of CG. Yeah, yeah. And so that, when did that tr uh, transition occur? And, and when did you make the move to the States? Oh, ah, so I was, um, I was very fortunate in my career because uh, I was working for a software company called um, Alias Research. Um, just a little bit of computer graphics history here for you and uh, and the listeners. So I'm really 21, um, <laughs> but no. Uh, the so back in '94, uh, no '93, I think I joined uh, a company called Alias Research. They got acquired um, by a company called Silicon Graphics, and Silicon Graphics was a Unix-based, uh, you know, supercomputer. Uh, they happened to acquire two companies, which was actually Alias and a company called Wavefront. Wavefront was based out of Santa Barbara. Alias was based, or Alias Research was based out of Toronto. They merged those two companies to create, um, a, well, I suppose, you know, one of the largest CG software companies in the world at the time. 
um, called Alias Wavefront. And uh, they were the creators of Maya. And I was, I happened to be one of the, you know, one of the, the pr engineers and, uh, and, and programmers, you know, for that product, um, you know, with, with, uh, with Alias Wavefront. So um, from there, my journey happened to go into computer games where I worked for EA Games for a period of seven years. And, you know, that was taking and helping the artists to grab um, next generation film techniques and bring them to the gaming environment, you know, because there was a not big fan of the word, but, you know, there was the convergence of filmic gaming, uh, get filmic um, uh, graphic quality, fidelity needed in games. And as you can see, games today are really rich in high fidelity graphics and visual effects and everything else. That back in the day was something that, you know, EA really wanted to push and they started to push that with FIFA, John Madden football, um, Harry Potter, and some of the other games that, you know, were, were launching, you know, from that company. And I was, I was helping and assisting to, to make that happen. I've spent a lot of time developing software through my career and all of the software has enabled the creatives to perform and work in a much more holistic way and a, a lot more kind of eco-friendly way as well. Cause there's a lot of pain points as an artist, you know, people don't realize that, um, you know, what you see on the screen takes hours of manpower and, or, or people power to create. And it's not just one person that develops any of this. And especially when it comes to um, computer graphics from that side, it is, you know, it's a, a huge team that develops a game or a feature film. And if we look at the architectural construction industry, it's an even larger team. And, you know, and that actually brings me also, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how all of this connects into how, what Vim is doing um, as, a, as a software uh, company. So I ended up coming to LA and working in LA for about seven years through a company called Shotgun Software, which was then acquired by Autodesk. And oh. uh, it's a pipeline um, product, um, production uh, application uh, on the cloud. And uh, when Shotgun got acquired by Autodesk, I happened to find, um, I was still in LA and I didn't want to, because I already worked for Autodesk before. Um, and I loved the company and everything else, but it just wasn't, something I wanted to do again. And having, having moved to LA with my family, I wanted to kind of go into the startup scene and I wanted to kind of feel what that was all about. And it was risky for us because, you know, I'm not a permanent resident of, of the US or anything along those lines. And so um, I obviously had some good friends from Electronic Arts and one of those was David Gardner. And I said to him, look, I'm stuck in LA, I need a job because, you know, a shotgun's been acquired. And he said, um, you remember David Helgeson? I said, yes, founder of Unity or co-founder of Unity. And I said, yeah, I do. And um, so he connected us and um, David and I met and he said, look, you know about architecture, you know a lot of stuff, you know, with your time at, EA, at um, uh, Autodesk and, and everything else. And I said, yeah. And he goes, can you help me because we're getting a lot of people buying our technology to come into the gaming space. They want to actually create real-time graphics. But we don't have anyone who's positioning our technology in the right way for people to use it. And I went, okay, you know what? I'll take on the challenge. Huge challenge it is because gaming technology back in the day, and this was just as Oculus was raising its money as well in mm -hmm. Orange County. So... There I was beating the streets and knocking the doors of all of the large architectural construction companies in North America, traveling around and, and doing my thing in regards to showing them what gaming technology could do for the AEC industry and how it's transformative in a way that conventional software is going to be left behind. And unfortunately, it was a lot of different conversations happened here and um, some of them fell on, you know, they just, they just didn't work out. Uh, some of those discussions, some of them said, some of these customers in the AC industry said, why do I need gaming technology? We're a serious organization. We develop buildings. 
And I said, look, to simulate your building, to develop your building before it's been even, you've even broken ground, you can do that in this. You can look at scheduling, you can look at different ways of setting up the, the layouts of those rooms with the owner. And the, the, the information you'll be giving back to the owner will be you know, hugely empowering to them. And they'll, they'll think that they're getting information that they've never had before. It'll you know, put a different spin on things. And um, a lot of that just fell on deaf ears, to be honest. It was such a hard discussion. So many people. But I have to be honest, um, we, I made some good friends. Um, so the journey of going to see many, many different architects and going into seeing the general contractors and engineers, uh, building owners, some of them saw the value of what a game engine could do, such as Unity. Um, and, uh, and Unreal. But the people who really embraced this, uh, there were a few companies actually, HOK was one, Gensler was another, um, you know, the, the, uh, Pepper Constructions, and you know, a construction company, another one. But at Gensler, they were really progressive in this and they were already starting to look at gaming technology. Um, a friend of mine, the late, the late Alan Robles, um, you, know, you know, and he, he was one who, really was at the forefront of pushing uh, digital experiences. His whole thing was, at Gensler, was about experiential design. And he could understand how a tool like real-time engines could actually benefit uh, an organization like Gensler massively to help their organization internally, but then also help the, the owners understand what was going on within the building that they were going to be paying you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for, or billions of dollars for, because again, is renowned for creating super skyscrapers, right? Same as Foster's and, and, and some of those guys. So, you know, with HOK, Foster's and Gensler and so, so forth, I would say the top 25, 30 architect companies really took on the gaming engine, um, uh, you know, kind of baton and ran with it. But it was. It wasn't until much later on that they they understood the value of it. It was um, about five years later. Now, for me, my journey, <laughs> you know, like most companies, what happens is, uh, you know, a new CEO comes in. So David Helgerson's. I was there for about two years, and we're pushing along the the whole piece of, you know, Unity for um, AEC. We're developing a product. And uh, we have a new CEO who joins and he says, hey, look, listen, we're going to have to pause all of this. So I, at that point, I'd already met um, Errol Wolf, uh, Wolford, my business partner. And he was creating something on the, on the side and on the back where he was already using Unity. And he had this crazy vision of taking Revit models and making them accessible through the gaming environment. And I was like, okay. And one of the biggest pain points when I was talking to anybody within the AEC space was, how do I take my Revit models? How do I take my CAD data and put it into virtual reality or even into a real-time engine of some sort? Now, I happened to talk to Errol and I said, look, Errol, you know, you're a super entrepreneur, you know, everything else. And I, and I said, look, we've got a real good opportunity here to partner with Unity and we could do some other things. And so this is where Vim, he already had a company, you know, and so we kind of piggybacked off the back of that and forged Vim AEC. And Vim AEC started out in developing technology that would go in from taking Revit models, uh, processing those, and it's all fully automated. We d you don't have to do anything. And it was all on the cloud initially. We went, right, the cloud is the way to go. What we realized was architectural models are, I mean, you know, they're huge. And, uh, you know, some of them are gigabytes big and we've got linked files and all these other things from Revit. And you're like, wow, this isn't going to work out. If we can do this locally, it's better. So we actually paused as a company for about two or three months. And we had to take a, a, a real kind of clear look at what we were building and how we were developing things. And at that point, there was, um, there was some big movements in the industry and some real key people at some large organizations were looking for positions, opening positions and, and new jobs. And 
you know, Joel Pennington, our head of product, was one of those. You know, I he know was, Joel Pennington. Yeah. <laughs> so Joel and I, you know, we used to work at EA together, uh, and we work, we crossed paths at at Autodesk as well. And he was a, and so he was looking for a new position, and you know, we happened to talk to him, and he said, "Look, this is great. Um, it would, I, I think, I can help you as a head of product. I can drive a vision on." what we could develop on that side. And he had some really good contacts and we brought in a, a head of R&D, um, Chris Diggins. And we developed with Chris and, and Joel, we developed something which is a, a game engine for the built environment. And it wasn't something that came easily because you know, when you're built on, you know, when you're using third party technology initially, and then you're going in and saying, guess what? third-party technology isn't going to cut the mustard. What you really need to do here is that we actually have to have our own technology because the built environment doesn't have anything that actually is dedicated for its requirements. And the requirements of the built environment are data. It's data. What Vim is all about is making data more accessible. And if you can make data more accessible, I'm pretty sure that we're going to help the ecosystem and the productivity of this industry. Because there's too many silos and those silos are creating issues because no one's talking to each other and no one's getting the data. And the only people who have the data are the people at the top of the food chain. But who really needs the data are all these people at the bottom because they're the guys who are either, you know, the general contractors or the trade contractors or, you know, everyone else that actually needs that data set. And so, you know, we built a game engine that is only for the built environment. It can manage really large data sets. We're talking gigabytes of data, tens of gigabytes of data. But the biggest thing is what we really worked on and what Christopher did was he did a multiples of, the, of, of, of different things. But the core aspect of this is that we created a new file format called the .vim format. It's specific to managing large amounts of data that can be transported with all of the BIM properties and metadata from the man product manufacturing uh, side as well. All of that data is going to be there. And the reason why we needed a, file, a new file format is because the built environment, as we move into the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, our cities are not going to become less condensed. They're going to actually become more condensed. Our buildings are going to go higher and more become more complicated and more complex. The data sets are going to become more complex. And unfortunately, you know, mentioned, you know, the FBX file formats, the RVT file formats and so forth, they're not going to make it. We had to develop something from the ground up that is going to help and be sustainable for that period of time, that next 30, 40 years. And so we built an open spec file format, which then sits within our engine. And so now we're the fastest engine out there that can take a Revit model, process that locally on your desktop and bring it onto a low powered device. And when we talk about low power devices, this is really important again, because within our industry, only the architects, and if you're sitting in an office, do you have maybe a, a computer with, you know, high level graphics or, yeah. or something along those lines. But 99% of the, of people in the construction industry are on the job site. They're using mobile devices, they're using low powered devices, they're using old laptops, you know, Laptops that don't have NVIDIA graphics cards or AMD graphics cards. In. They're Intel-based, you know, Lenovo laptops or so. And so the way that the architecture of Vim has been created is it's all about low-power devices enabling large model data sets that you can visualize and actually gain all the data from and data for. And the more data we want to, we all, we all we at Vim want to do is give you access to as much information as data as possible to make 
you know, as, as Vim, you know, is that, that coordination application within the built environment, then, connecting lots of different people. So when you're in the Vim environment, you can then have like, you know, a huddle session and you can have like 30 people, 40 people within a huddle session within that. You can take notes, you can do multiples of things, but we want to democratize those complex tools that people say, hey, guess what? That's my territory. Well, this is the same thing that happened in the film industry and in the games industry and so forth. If you do not democratize the tools, you do not drive efficiency. And so, you know, when we, you know, we've put technology like clash detection inside of Vim, we've got tools like quantity takeoff inside of Vim. All of these tools are to enable and then to break down the wall garden silos of I, you can only do that over there or you can only do this with that team. We give access to those tools, to those people who can actually become and make the industry more productive. This episode of the Future Construct podcast is supported by the amazing team at Applied Software. They have solutions for any modern project. Applied Software is on a mission to transform industry by empowering their clients and being the champions of innovation with their real world expert consultants. They have a comprehensive suite of solutions for AEC, MEP and manufacturing, and they have a singular focus to help you achieve higher performance. They have software, training, support, consulting, and custom development. Applied Software has you absolutely covered for all of your workflow needs. And BIM Designs is proud to be a client and partner of Applied Software. So visit ASTI.com, that is A-S-T-I.com, and please let them know that Feature Construct and BIM Designs sent you. I, I, I've got so much to comment on here. This is such a great story, and I think you know, it's so interesting that you pointed out that, you know, there was a, a time and place where, you know, that the entertainment industry sort of impacted gaming, but I think we're actually in kind of the opposite construct now where it's like storytelling and creativity yeah. and, and the way we tell stories is going to have much more of a game engine construct, right? With branching narratives and, and so forth. So I, I love I love kind of drawing that particular line, but also I think to your point, you know, we start thinking about, you know, IoT and smart buildings mm -hmm. and smart cities. None of them are going to be smart <laughs> unless they're able to speak to each other, unless they're speaking the same language. And it's not going to be IoT anymore. It's you know I like to call it IOE. I think that's starting to take take hold. It's you know the Internet of Everything, and and I, I think I think this is a really interesting journey, and it's. And it's funny, I think in a lot of ways, your career has always been, you know, kind of just at the, at the crest of, of sort of the new waves of, of technology. I and mean, I've spent, you know, a lot of time with Maya artists. I was more on the commercial side of things than on feature films, but that whole explosion of special effects and computer graphics and, you know, how that, that has evolved. Um, I, I think it's a really interesting journey you've been on and I'm really excited about you know, I think what the opportunity is with them and just with AEC in general is that, you know, we have technology today that will allow you to see through walls and you can do it on your mobile device. You know, it's, yeah. I think that's pretty fascinating. I think, you know, you said something that that's really, really important that we should probably unpack a little bit is that it's, it's on low powered devices. It's on devices you have, you know, in situ that, that probably don't have any connectivity. And it's interesting you talk about the cloud because we do talk about, you know, cloud 5G edge and what that's going to enable. But on these construction sites, they don't have Wi-Fi and they don't have access, right? And so I think it's a really um, smart way to have thought out how to deliver this, this content. I, you know, you raise a really interesting point there, which is that whole piece that when you're on a job site, you are really, you know, you may not have Wi-Fi. Your dependency on Wi-Fi is frustrating at that point. You know, in, in having spoken to many general contractors and trade contractors, they're like, look, we're on the job site. We haven't got time or we don't have access to, to, to Wi-Fi. And so, so our whole intent is, yes, you can have data in the cloud, but actually making it accessible on your device you know, whether it's a, a, a tablet or a, um, a Microsoft um, a Surface Pro or an Intel GPU based computer, those are the kind of devices that exist on the on on a uh, on a job site. You know, and that comes back to 
um, accessibility of information and data. One of the things that we really, uh, it really grinds on me is, is wall gardens, okay? Now, wall gardens are created by software companies because they don't want you to go and go to the neighbor, right? You know, because you, you don't want to go and smell their roses. You want to smell, you know, these roses over here. So there's all these things. And, and so we're there. We're not here about wall gardens. We want to knock those wall gardens down. That's what we're doing with the .vim file format being open spec. That enables data to transfer very easily between products and across people as well. You know, there's that whole thing. The McKinsey, the McKinsey report came out a few years ago and it said, you know, productivity within the manufacturing and other industries was over a thousand percent over the last 40 years. And in the AC space, it was only 8%. Well, that's because we're still doing it the old way. You know, I mean, building as, you know, the, the construction industry has not moved on in using technology to, to help it advance itself. But also we have got, well, if it's not broken, why fix it type of mentality as well. Um, and there is, I fear, I, I do see this a lot, uh, you know, a lot of the times in the discussions I have. And that is, there's almost a fear in using technology as well in some cases. It's like, you know, and 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 there's there's a lack of kind of understanding that there needs to be that investment. And if that investment doesn't come in, and there are some people in the industry who are actually charging the way, they're going to lead the way forward. Because if you're going to want to move into construction 4.0 and industry 4.0, well, data is the only way you're going to move there. And, and actually using a real-time engine like Vim is, is one of those methods. And the reason why that happens is because Conventional software has a shelf life. Um, you know, there's, it's not, you can't run Revit on a, on a Lenovo laptop, but you can run Vim uh, or, you know, a real-time engine on that. So if people really need to start looking at this seriously because it's not going to go away. And if you don't move with it, then you're going to get left behind. And the people who are putting pedal to the metal are going to actually accelerate way past them. Yeah, it's it's a Netflix versus blockbuster scenario it for is. sure. It's like you see the technology coming, and what's what's ironic about the the AC industry is it's an industry that is primarily it's three D, right? They already have three yeah. D chops. They have you know they've the three D three D vernacular, and we are very quickly moving away from two D screens. We need to be able to access you know to your point the the data anywhere anytime time on the devices that we currently have but the magic wayfarers are coming we talk about yeah. this a lot and you know even just having a fluency you know it would be very simple for a company who's you know already leveraging um, them and, and being able to visualize them data in, in situ how simple will it be for them to migrate to these new devices and how much of an advantage is that going to be to already you know have all of those models and have you know, those, those, you know, even through the construction phase and then, and then, you know, you have an as built that, that lives and, and breathes on because you finish construction and you're never finished with construction. Right? <laughs> There's always yeah, something and absolutely. you're still going to need to access all of that data. And so I think that's, yeah. you know, it's a really fascinating world that you inhabit. And I think you've solved a, a, a really big problem that I don't think is perceived as a problem yet. You know, so, you know, simple will it be to be able to move from these mobile devices to these wearables when, when they hit the market. And I think the companies that are, that are moving to, you know, this digital landscape are, are the ones who are definitely going to, to win in the future. You know, and I, I, there's so much more, I think we're going to have to have you back on because we have a lot more to um, no, unpack, fine. but, but, but we're, but we're, uh, we're out of time today. However, I'm not going to let you leave without our last no. question. Yes. Which is, and I ask this of everyone. So if you could project yourself, you know, 25 years into the future and you could have, you know, anything, gadget, thing, service, whatever it happens to be that would make you personally happy or just make your life better in some way, what would it be and what would it do? Okay. Um, so I'm a huge petrol head. So I love cars and, and, and so forth, but, uh, so for me, it would be a, okay. So I know we're, you know, the, the conversations of flying vehicles have always been there and, and so forth, but 
to me that that would be something that would be huge like in the next 20 years I want to I want to be able to just lift off and go somewhere you know I don't want to get stuck in traffic there might be air traffic control I'm sure but or something but it would be amazing to be able to have that have your own little landing pad in your own garden I'm going to send you a video that I I talked a lot that it's it's, you know um, yeah it was Airbus actually made but in in thinking about the built environment as well you know I mean it, it kind of comes back to the whole Blade Runner piece and everything else but you know, I think there is something about flying vehicles. I think there's something about flying cars and being able to to own something along those lines. And I don't think um, I'm fortunate enough to live in a place where, you know, we've got a garden and, and everything else. But, you know, um, city sky rises are just going taller and taller and higher and higher. And, you know, I mean, just walk outside your window and or your port maybe and you just slide in and car it's like the Jetsons I suppose a bit right but well I and you know it's funny I always always say that like I there's so much on the Jetsons that I want to bring into like the walkway that she goes on and she just puts her arms out and clothes come on and you know autonomy. like the whole Um, of the Jetsons would be great yeah (laughs) all of them we talk about haptics and, you know, and, and, and gestural menus. I mean, they had them in there, you know, already. And yes. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I would say that would be my, my one. I have another one, but I won't talk about that one right now. I'll leave that. For okay. Next time. All right. Okay. Well, we're, we're going to have, I, we just, we're just gonna have to do really, really good driving courses. I'm not going to name names of states where people don't drive well, California, New Jersey, New York. Uh, oh, I did. Yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, but yeah, the driving license, I think we're going to have to have a higher bar than we currently do for flying cars. I think so. Yeah. But I look, but I look forward to the day. <laughs> oh, absolutely. So do I. I think it's going to be fun when you can do that. Though. <laughs> well, Sanjay, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Amy. Thank you for having us. And, uh, this was amazing. Really appreciate it.